Now let me give you a, a brief account of the, th of the theory that this is based on. So this is based on the idea that everybody has a justice motive. That when you are harmed or transgressed against in some way, the natural thing to do is want, wanting to get justice. In fact, it's probably to pay the other person back. There's been research using game theory that some Swiss researchers uh, headed by a guy named Fair did in which they found that when people were transgressed against in this game, people had a choice, they were given a choice of paying the other person back by verbally abusing them, they were given the opportunity to do this, or by uh, actually taking money from them. However, to take money from them, they had to give up an equal amount of money. So I could make you give me $20, but I have to give up $20 in order to do that. A lot of people chose that as their way of getting back at somebody. Now, when this study was done, people were placed in functional MRI units while they were making these decisions about whether they were going to get back at the person by social means or by actually paying their own money to make the other person suffer. And the people who chose to just tell you anything they wanted to tell you, no matter how negative, and you had to sit there and listen, okay, nothing much interesting went on in their brain. Just the usual amygdala, rage, limbic system arousal, you know, just ho-hum, another emotional outburst. But for the people who decided that they're going to make you suffer by actually giving up money, even though it's costing them. As they were about to make that decision, the pleasure pathways in their brain triggered off. You know, they got an actual physical pleasure in their brain for paying you back and making you suffer in a real tangible way that they don't get from just fussing at you or telling you you're stupid, see? So this is something built into the human psyche. This is, the, this is something natural. It's a good thing in that it gives us a strong desire for justice. We want justice. This is the way God made us. But we can warp the way that we try to get justice by getting it as vigilante justice by injuring the other person. Still, it's the way God made us, but we're misusing it. So what happens is we have this justice motive, and when we've been harmed, the first thing that we do is we start our mental computer going. And we establish what I call the injustice gap. It's a kind of mental calculation that's going on, and it says, this is the way I would like this situation resolved. This is the way it is right now. They're different. I want them to be the same. So now they keep this computer going as subsequent events happen. And those, that substance, sub, those subsequent events affect the size of the injustice gap. Now, does this make intuitive sense to you that if you have a big sense of injustice, a big injustice gap, it's really hard to forgive? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you have this little bitty event, it's not hard to forgive, right? So this size of this injustice gap makes a big difference. So let me give you an example of this. Suppose that I, uh, suppose that somebody at work sends around an email saying about 
kind of embarrassing me by telling all my failures in the last year. They post this on the web, or they post this, yeah, that would be even worse. They post this to the, the, the work group, right? Okay, now, I'm hurt that they would do something like this. So I go to them. I've got this huge injustice gap. And I say to them, you know, it really hurt my feelings when you put all my mistakes out to everybody in the Department of the Psychology. Person looks me right in the eye and says, hey, life is full of little disappointments, isn't it? <laughs> so what happens to my injustice gap? Yeah, it gets bigger. You know, things got worse. Right? I still want it resolved like before, but things got worse. My injustice gap is bigger. I have more to forgive now. But if, what would happen if instead I'd said, you know, it hurt my feelings when you did this, and the person goes, I didn't realize that. Oh, God, I didn't. I wasn't thinking. I, I'm, I feel like dirt. I, I am scum on the bottom of your shoes. Kick me, beat me. I deserve it. You know, I, what can I do to make this up to you? Could I, could I give you like a million dollars? Would that take the edge off? You know? And I go, yeah, well, that'd probably help a little bit. <laughs> and then they say, well, could I, could I clean your toilets for the rest of my adult life? I say, okay, all right, you know, I can forgive you then. So what happened here? I had this injustice gap. They go, oh, I feel terrible, I feel sorry. They, they humble themselves. Then they say, could I make restitution? What can I do? Can I give you a million dollars? Yeah, that would help. Can I clean the toilets? Yeah, that, that would really help, right? See, now I've got this little bitty injustice gap to forgive. It's easy to forgive. So forgiveness is made a lot easier if I reduce the injustice gap, however I can reduce that. So, in order to forgive, there are two uh, types of forgiveness. These two types of forgiveness are not joined at the hip with each other. One is to make a decision to forgive. I call this by the clever name of decisional forgiveness. I'm verbally adept, what can I say? Okay, so decisional forgiveness is to make a decision to not act in a way that will get even with you, that will harm you, to as much as possible act in a way that puts our relationship back on the pre-offense level given that there are certain conditions that have to be made. It's a behavioral intention statement. It is made you know, quickly. It may take me a year to wrestle through or 10 years to wrestle through to where I decide I'm going to forgive this person. But when I forgive them, it's like flipping a light switch on or off. I either have or I have not committed to behave in a different way toward them. But even if I make a decision to forgive the person, then I might still be emotionally angry with them, resentful, even bitter, hostile, hateful, angry, fearful that I'm going to be hurt again. I've made a decision. It's a sincere decision. The rest of my life, I will not get even with this person. I, I commit myself to that but I'm still bitter and angry and emotionally unforgiving. Those two are different. They should have different names. They should not both be called with the name forgiveness. But one is called decisional forgiveness and one is called emotional forgiveness. They are. Now these two concepts are, I believe, they show up in Scripture. So, for example, you remember the disciples' prayer, right? And Jesus prays, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? So Jesus was Presbyterian apparently when he prayed these. That was a joke, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, 
forgive us our trespasses, whatever. So what he's praying there is, God, forgive me to the extent I forgive people who have hurt me. Just in case we miss that, two verses later in Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he says, for, this is the only part of the disciples' prayer he, he explains, he says, for if you don't forgive those who harm you, your Father in heaven won't forgive you. But if you do forgive, your Father in heaven will forgive you. Okay, let me flash on later into Peter going up to Jesus and saying, Lord, how many times do we have to forgive somebody if, the, you know, they offend us in a day? How many times? Seven? And Jesus says what? Not seven, but seven. 70 times seven or 77 times, however you translate that. But anyway, most commentators and theologians think that means every time, infinitely. You always have to. But let's be really literalistic about this thing, right? And let's be liberal and literalistic. So we're going to interpret that as 77 times. I only have to forgive the person 77 times if they hurt me in a day. So I'm in a room by myself, and in they walk, and boom, they do something that horribly offends me. And I go, I forgive you. And I'm going to expect my emotions to just love you. They come in 20 minutes later and they offend me again. And I go, I forgive you. And my emotions are going to come in line. Trial number 76, right? They come in, they've offended me already 75 times. What do you think the chances are my emotions are going to change? Zilch, you see, because I don't believe that the type of forgiveness Jesus is talking about there is emotional forgiveness. He's talking about decisional forgiveness. Could I, even after 77 times, say, I'm not going to get even with you, brother. I am really torqued about this. I don't anticipate getting over this for the next 10 years. I'm not going to get even with you. I'm not going to pay you back. You know, I forgive you. Could I do that? Yeah, be hard, very hard. It's so hard that the disciples knew it right away, and their response to that was, Lord, increase our faith. They know it's hard, right? So, so it's hard, but it can be done. It's different than emotional forgiveness. Emotional forgiveness is that transformation that comes inside of me where negative, unforgiving emotions are replaced by positive, other-oriented emotions. That is like just like I've got these negative acid of unforgiveness in my system and I'm dropping chemicals that are opposite to that, that are basic and they're neutralizing drop by drop. I'm replacing the negativity with positivity. Now, if this is a stranger who's harmed me, I quit adding positive usually when I get back to zero. I don't want to be best buddies with somebody who's robbed me. I just want to get to zero, right? But if this is my wife, I'm not happy getting to zero. I'm, I want to get, I want to keep adding the positive after this. So complete forgiveness for a partner, for someone that you're in an ongoing valued relationship with, you're, you're doing more than just replacing it, replacing the negativity till it gets to be zero.